All right, what's going on, everybody? Rob Satram, Feedback Ranch. I'm here with the amazing Merlin Satram. So this is my dad. <laughs> and uh, we're going to talk about, if you're an entrepreneur, business owner, um, or even just a professional, we're going to talk about value. And we're going to talk about kind of the challenges that my dad has gone through. Um, he's a very challenged person. <laughs> <laughs> I do have a lot of challenges. You do have a lot of challenges. So just to clarify, uh, I'm 39 years old. My dad is older than that. And um, he's just retired. So he he quit working, but, uh, tell us a little bit about what have you been doing over the years? Well, and, and just real quick guys, this is all about trying to help people convey value. We want to help business owners get better at what they do. You know, we do, um, websites, accounting, or we, we help accountants, small business owners with their websites. And just long story short, if you're trying to grow your business, um, we want to help you. So head to feedbackranch.com. We got a podcast too. So this is going on iTunes, Google podcasts, this is on the YouTube channel. Um, so yeah, we just want to talk about value. So the whole idea here is um, value is a bigger subject than what most people think. And, and I always laugh because I'll, I'll tune into these guys, these consultants, like I'll get into these like bookkeeper or, or entrepreneur groups and they're like, you know what the key to making good money is? You got to sell on value. So that's your first check mark. You're like, well, that's sufficient. I know what I'm doing now. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so we want to get Go to more step 10 right away. Yeah. It's like, first of all, what we're going to do is we're going to try and score more points than the other team. That's how you win football yeah, games. There you go. So what we want to do is we want to give you some specific insights, some, some thoughts that we've had. And the reason why I wanted to bring my dad in here, we're going to have Merlin in here much more often because all the good stuff I learned. Um, I think I learned from him and <laughs> I might not be very good at things, but I'm, I don't know. I'm okay at it. And, uh, you do good. <laughs> <laughs> so what we want to do is just we want to bring some insight. And, uh, and I'll just say that my dad was at Ziegler, which is a cat dealership here in Minneapolis and in Bloomington. And, and, uh, you had the benefit of doing a ton of B2B sales, right? That's the cool thing about what you did. So this might not be how to sell accounting packages. This might not be how to get better at your your digital marketing firm. You might not think that, but it, it very much is. Um, it's all about solving problems and whatnot. So why don't you walk me through a little bit? Tell us about your career. Wh when did you get started? What did you do? And uh, fill me in, my man. Well, after being a hungry farm boy from North Dakota, I ended up going to uh, North Dakota State University and, and uh, getting a degree in construction technology, which is a subset of construction management. And in May, when everyone else had jobs, because almost everybody else in the in the department were sons of contractors, mm -hmm. they all had jobs because they were going home to run their dad's companies. Well, I didn't have a job. So in May, in our business class, the, our department chair said, anybody interested in selling heavy equipment? Well, another guy and I, we raised our hands. Of course, we were, we were willing. And then pretty soon, somebody said, well, what kind of equipment? And our uh, department chair said, what's the matter? Don't you want to sell Kamatsu? <laughs> and Kamatsu is, really? a, is a, that's a, a brand trying to be Caterpillar real hard, in my opinion. <laughs> anyway, our hands stayed up. You know, we were willing. It was a cat dealer, so we were very willing. I interviewed. Um, there was some good connections there. Ziegler had me come down for down from Fargo to Minneapolis for a, an interview. And they... Offered me the job and I and I took the job. So it was to be a sales trainee. And I I really had never sold anything to my knowledge growing up on a farm for my first 25 years. In fact, there was a TV show called WKRP in Cincinnati. And if you Google that, uh, their salesman was Herb Tarlick and he wore Herb. plaid pants and and got awful ugly jackets. So my classmates at NDSU all called me Herb Tarlick because I was going to go be the salesman. They were going to go hold survey stakes out on the construction. Because you crew. grew up in this. How big is Page, North Dakota? 100, uh, 200 people. I graduated in a class of 27. 27 so, people. Yep, so, yep. And so, it is out. So this is like two hours west of Fargo. Oh, right? an, hour, an hour west of Fargo. And that. so what era is this? This is the er, mid-80s, right? I grew up in the, in the 70s. Well, 70s. I went to college in the 80s. Then I, I farmed for sometime and then realized this is a good way to grow up. It is not a career I want to have. It wasn't in my blood. So, so now one of the things I think is really cool. You went back to school. You had, you had two kids. I did. And I was you, an older than average student with two, two children. I literally walked to school both ways uphill. Cause you were so rich. You were like, <laughs> that's the other thing that I think is funny. Like growing up and being in, 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 in the South suburb of Minneapolis, St. Paul here is oftentimes there's this connotation that everybody has money and you come from money. Um, 
you weren't exactly like a, a big farmer. Um, no, we, I, I farmed 400 acres on my own. My dad and I together farmed 1600 acres, which was a small to medium sized farmer. And, uh, when I, when I left, I, I took nothing with me. I had, we had no money. I had, we had no jobs. I worked for the city of Fargo in the summertime to pay the bills. My, my wife, your mother, Barb, she, uh, did substitute teaching and uh, we, you know, do did what we could to get by. So you were, you were work, you were going back to school. You were working for the city. You had two kids. We're living in a trailer. Yep. Hustling. Yep. Mom is sp- staying home with us because you don't need childcare and all that nonsense. Yep. So she's investing in us. You're working hard, trying to level up and get to this point. And this is, so I'm born in 1982. So this would be like early eighties is when you're going through. My this. bankers <clears throat> wanted me to, f- in 1981, or my banker wanted me to buy land and buy a fleet of equipment. Mm. And I chose not to do that. Had I done that, interest rates went over 20%. They would have been loading up my farm in the back of a bunch of trucks, and I would have been done anyway. This is back so when interest rates are super high. Like- my class, in, in, in deference to my classmates that did like farming, they, they went to NDSU and got their ag degrees, and they're wonderful farmers, and they're great people. And uh, I, I chose not to do that. So... So th- this guy shows up at NDSU and he's like, "Hey, who wants to sell tractors?" You raise your hand, you go and interview, and you come out here in what eighty six is when you. Uh, nineteen eighty five, June of nineteen eighty five. So I was a I was a trainee uh, for the first summer. Then I was their developmental salesman. I I got my um, chauffeur's license and, and and demoed cat came out with a new backhoe loader. I lugged one of those around and sold backhoe loaders as a demo operator. Um, as a developmental salesman. And then in the spring of 86, one of our salesmen with a nice territory came into the office to manage parts and service. And they, my sales manager took me out to lunch and offered me that territory. No kidding. And uh, I was rather stunned. It was a, it was a very nice territory. Three, three local counties could be home every night. And um, so I, I did that for 17 years. And then, um, then they offered me, they asked me to come in and manage small equipment. We got into skid steers and small excavators. And so then I did that for five years and then uh, went up to be the heavy equipment sales manager, one of the heavy equipment sales managers for the last several years and and just retired at the end of last year, just realizing after 35 years, Ziegler's treated me very well. My customers were great. The staff was great. The salespeople were great. But I have five grandkids and and uh, you and your brother uh, want to spend more time with. So I decided to retire. Yeah. I did. And we love it. It's super fun. The fact that you can come and do this yep. and, and uh, help me in little ways. I covet every minute that I'm <laughs> with you. And uh, I, I think all of us do. That's the funny thing. You're a good grandpa. You're a good dad. You're a good, uh, you, you were decent at selling tractors, I think too. So, <laughs> um, but so this whole idea is you go out, you're a farmer. And I always think it's funny when you first think about farming, I think, as far from a salesperson as you possibly could. Um, now I've, I've recently kind of drawn these conclusions that I think farmers understand entrepreneurship really well, except for that they get these government programs that kind of help them live in cycles. You know, we, we need to help our farmers, I suppose. So there's all these different cycles or maybe their risk is a little bit different than a typical entrepreneur, but um, you, you go from farming to now you, you said you started out, you're pulling a backhoe, a new backhoe around and you're trying yep, to, yep. what the heck is that? So what is that actually like a normal day? Like, what are you actually doing? What does it look like to go pull around a backhoe? Do you have a list of people? Like, what? Well, the yeah, you, the marketing department set, set me up with a list of prospects to, to, uh, to connect with. And at the time in 1984 and 85, uh, case, and John Deere and Ford New Hall Ford were the big tobacco uh, market share holders. Cat didn't even make one. And so Caterpillar, being a, a very progressive company, they don't like to be number two in anything. They want to be number one in everything they do um, by, a, by a lot. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. so we had our work cut out for us. And Ziegler is an amazing dealership that always wanted to be the number one dealer for Caterpillar if they could. So we were all in. And... Uh, you know, we grew the market share to be as good or better than most everybody else. But so it's to take a machine around and everybody's skeptical of you because first of all, this is not your your wheelhouse and what you do. And second of all, you're a caterpillar, so it's going to be way more expensive than everybody else. Mm. And so, you know, our job truly is to convey value like we were talking about and, and bring it down to 
you know, how does that value apply to that little contractor or that person buying the backhoe loader? And then attach all the components to value that that we have always Caterpillar and Ziegler have observed make a difference in the in the bottom line, so to speak, of a of a customer. Mm-hmm. And maybe we hit on that real quick. I think I think these are interesting. This is almost like fast forwarding because I do want to hear. Yeah. Uh, were you any good at that at first? Like, what was it like when you were first? You're a new salesman. You're going out there. You're trying to. You're calling on these people. Like, do you have some? Well, I don't think stories? I was a very good salesman to start with, and 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 you know, I always thought there was way better salesmen than me. I, I thought I was a good listener. I thought I could become a a, a pretty good consultant for customers. Um, my customers taught me a lot. They're brilliant people. I'm still good friends with a lot of them. They were some of the best business people and men and women that I've ever met. So um, there was always better salesmen than me, but but I think I've fit the Ziegler mold rather well. I think, mm-hmm. uh, you know, um, I do believe in the Caterpillar product and, and the, and today I'm loyal to products. I, mm-hmm. I don't like having a real diversified shelf because it costs money to have parts for everything. Yep. And I don't like and going, to buy the wrong thing. Buy it twice. I hate yep. buying something. Yep. And it, we were just looking at chairs just so you know, I am notorious for destroying chairs and sending <laughs> them to the pits of hell. Um, I sit on a chair and it's like, well, I'm, I'm not going to buy cheap furniture. Cause why, why don't I just, instead of buying the $300 one, that's going to break in 10 minutes. Why don't I just wait and buy a, a better one? Um, but you know, I think what was interesting is I was growing up, always thinking the cat is so much better and yet cat's good, but that's not necessarily the whole story about no. what, what's valuable. And I think this is what I think a, a listener, if you can hear this, there, there's a number of things that are far more valuable than just having the best, right? To an extent, you know, an Apple computer is, and that's maybe an anomaly. Maybe we don't talk about Apple, but you know, Caterpillar machinery is certainly better in most cases, but every once in a while, there's something out there that kind of, might contend, yeah. right? Yeah. So what's the complete value proposition that 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 you guys are trying to bring? And and talk to me about that uphill battle that you're always going through. And you, you talk about efficiency, you talk about um, resale value, you talk about a, a number of different things. But why don't you just remind me of what that all looks like on some of these things? Well, we kind of broke, you know, we, we in order to quantify it, people need to have some numbers to it. And uh, if we ask the right questions and kind of get to the right values, we can we can quantify it. And really, what you do, you, you buy a machine. There's there's really seven things when you purchase a machine, and it doesn't matter if it's Anderson Windows or or a Toro lawnmower or Milwaukee drill. The first thing you do is you want to be productive with it. So if you can be more productive, and in any way you quantify production, whether it's yards per hour or uh, or, or a number of holes you drill in an hour, whatever it is, the more productive you can be. That's the number one thing to do to be to make more money is be more productive. Second thing is to is to be available, be up and running. Every time I want to go use my Milwaukee drill or my Toro lawnmower, does it start? And can I use it? Or do now I got to load it up and drag it into the dealer or wait and have somebody come and service it or my carrier air conditioner. That doesn't matter what it is. Um, how many times when I go to turn the key on that thing, is it going to start and do my work for me? So that's the second second thing. And those first two things, they're the number one and number two uh, money makers. Be productive and be up and running. And and we thought we could prove that that would be the case. So what are some things that go into productivity? I, th- I think what's interesting, you, you've even mentioned like comfort. Oh, yeah. Can the guys stay in there? You know, yeah. I always laugh when I used to sell computers, people would come in and they go, oh, I don't want anything fancy. I just want something simple. And it was funny. I got to this point where I'm like, the more you want it simple, probably the more money you should spend to just buy a Mac. Like yeah. you should just like forego everything. Don't buy the $500 laptop, buy a $2,000 Mac. You'll thank yourself later. But talk to me about like, what are the things that would go into productivity or, or uptime or in all of that when it comes to a tractor like that? Like, oh, you really hit on it, Rob. It's really the same thing for machines. It is how easy is it to use? Do I have, can I be comfortable at 3.30 in the afternoon? Am I as comfortable as I am at eight o'clock in the morning? And comfort is the position of the seat, the kind of seat, heating and cooling, how easy the, you know, how much do you have to turn around? Um, how easy are the levers to push and pull all day long? How much it can be automized, uh, automated? Um, and now, of course, new <laughs> machines in 2021, 
I almost got too old for this now because the new stuff is all GPS and computerized. And man, it's like a farmer in a tractor. You don't, you just sit there. So, you know, all of those pieces. But if you think about shifting and about knowing how close your cutting edge is to the, to the, the edge of the job or, or to the, the, the edge of the truck, if you're, if you're loading, that, that's confidence. And if you have ultimate confidence, you're going to do it right every time. Your cycle times are quicker. Production in the earth moving business is cycle time multiplied times payload. Mm. How much do you move and how fast do you move it? And we want short cycle times and big payloads that don't break the machine in half. Oh, that's interesting. So, so that's efficiency. Now in entrepreneurs, this is something that I've been finding a lot with, whether you're a contractor or even you're an insurance salesman, or if you're an accountant doing this B2B thing that I'm always talking about, um, for, the idea of you got to have the tools around, whether it's a website that you can present on, you can have things working while you're sleeping, um, but your efficiency needs to be paramount because when you shift out to be an entrepreneur, and especially if you're that solopreneur, when you're by yourself, folks don't really fathom how valuable their time is. Even if they're not making high billing yet, even if you don't have very many clients, um, your time is even more precious because you're like going into the margin. You have to, you have to hustle and, and be productive. And sometimes I'll talk to entrepreneurs and we're looking at their website and we'll build them a nice website and they're like me and, and, and they're, they've got this scarcity mentality where it's like, oh gosh, I don't think I should turn on ads because you're talking another thousand dollars this month. Now, I'm not telling people to go out and just waste money, but there's an investment in your business to produce. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to getting yeah. leads, sales is paramount and sales is what allows you to then do your work. So there's this weird connection between um, advertising actually helps you get to the point where you can have the money and you can be efficient. But this idea that you're going to go out and call everybody like that's inefficient. You're wasting yeah. your time. Yeah. If I can spend a hundred dollars in a day and I don't have to drive to that stupid networking meeting, or I don't have to lug around and just hope I bump into somebody and I can bring a video to 2000 people in that day through a YouTube ad. That's huge. And it's not totally, um, you know, it's not the same thing as what you're talking about. But, uh, th so those first two things are, what were they again? Well, it's it's a productivity, a productivity and then availability. But I'm glad you touched on efficiency because efficiency is how much work do you get done with the available resource? Oh. And there are machines that push more. Um, there's machines that load more, but they burn way more fuel. So, mm. if, you know, how how much work do you get done in with a gallon of fuel? How much how much dirt can you move before you have to overhaul a machine? So how much work do you get done with the available resource? And it, it doesn't matter what it is, machines, computers, mm -hmm. cameras, it, everything, there's efficiency and should always be looking to be more efficient. And mm -hmm. that's what engineers do. They're always tweaking. That's why there's new models because yep. the new ones are more efficient. And it can be a number of things, including electronics and GPS and computer chips and <laughs> Yeah. You know, the whole the whole piece of it. And availability, that's an interesting one too. That's uptime. You know, how does your dealer keep you up? Or how, how does how durable, you know, how durable is the product? Um you told me about a model that you, you a remote control model that our grandson had and he, he cranked on it and broke the plastic gear in it. Mm -hmm. Um so it's a cool model, but it wasn't durable enough to have the availability you need. Now, if you could, you know, run down to quick trip and buy that gear and stick it in, that'd be pretty cool. And that was one of the things Ziggler and Caterpillar always wanted to do was always have the parts on hand that you need. Mm -hmm. And pretty much 98% of what you ask us for at Ziggler for parts, you you, you go home with. Which is or easy you get for you it, to You say. get it right away. But where this really played out, you you talk about stories where you, you'd you walk into a customer, a farmer, whoever it is, and it was always, especially when you got into skid steers or track, compact track, loaders is yep. what they are, right? Yep. And you would walk in there and then, oh, I'm a Bobcat guy right away, right? A great company. Or a case yep. Yep. Or, or whatever it was, but that they'd have like, oh, how many of those do you have? You know, t talk to me about some oh, of there was a there was a dairy farmer uh, and he had five of those machines and we were trying to sell them on a Caterpillar and he goes, oh, I, 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 yeah, in that case it was Bobcat, I'm a Bobcat guy. And he goes, how many do you have? I go, well, I got five. Well, how, you know, what we always do would ask, well, how are they doing for parts and service? Everybody makes good machines. There isn't a machine out there that's a miserable. They're all nice and clean, and they all got all the new technology. That every, everybody 
everybody does a good job making their new machines. And, and so then we always ask them, how, how is parts availability? And what do you do when you can't get a part? And the guy goes, interesting, interesting you asked that. That's why I have five. <laughs> well, how many do you really need? Well, I need three. Well, doesn't your dealer have the extra ones you need when you're broke down? Well, no, they're way over in, in another town. So because the dealer doesn't have the parts and doesn't have the loaner machines or the rental machines, you have to have two more machines. That's the, the piece that we always thought we could offer is, how about you let us build a storeroom and have parts on hand? And we're pretty good at it because we have major market share. And then how about you have a, let us have a rental fleet that we can provide you, whether, you know, whether we agree on a, lo- a free loaner or whether it's a, a rental to back you up. You don't need to do that. And, and see, you only need three machines. How much money do you save by only needing three machines? Well, you by far can pay for three Caterpillars versus three competitive machines. One of the neat things about entrepreneurs is, remember folks, you can build these value propositions into what you're trying to achieve for your customers, right? You may not be there yet, but when you mention this idea of that you have tons of parts on hand, right? So your dealership selling a good tractor, but it yeah. wasn't just about that tractor. The factors are far more than just the product. In fact, I've been working with two dealerships right now, and both of them were encouraging them to to do the hard work to find what is it that causes things to go great for you and for your customers. And then when they go poorly for your customers, what does that actually look like? You you always talk about this. As soon as a customer is talking to you about, ah, oh, my machine broke down. I bought the cat from you and it's breaking down. And they start going on and on and on about how important it is that they get back up. You used to train your salespeople to be like, take notes because they're telling you yep. what's valuable to them. Like that's they're right. they're actually quoting all yep. of your points. Yep, that's right. They'll tell you the stories of what happens when they're down and how you know how inconvenient it is. And pretty soon they will almost talk themselves into a caterpillar if you ask the right questions. That, that, that's very true. And I think another interesting thing is um, when you build a business, I think folks should try to be the type of business that has more value to it. Mm-hmm. There's selling on price stinks. And we'll we'll talk about the different things. How do you build trust? How do you position yourself well so that you're not forced on just going on price? But I talk to a lot of folks out there and they're so skittish about all oh, my competitors cheaper, you know, the home services. I, I have a couple home services companies I've talked to in the last couple of weeks. So they're doing windows, they're doing gutters, they're doing lawn stuff, they're cleaning homes. They're, and they get so nervous about getting under bid, but then they get too busy. You know, we always talk about that. What, what's your thing that you talk about? If you're too busy, it's time to. Well, I always, I always caution my salesman. If you're, if you're, if your customers are telling you how busy they are, they're they're not charging enough, mm-hmm. and they need to find that balance where they're they only have so many hours in a year. You know, in Minnesota, if you're outside and you're working, it's 22 hours a year on a on a machine is un- unbelievable use. 1500 hours is is a full season, mm. but if they're getting over 2000 hours. That guy's reporting to that machine every day and and mm-hmm. getting in it. So um, if they're that busy, they're not. They they should raise their prices. Mm-hmm. Really, they should they should figure out how to get a little bit more money for it. And and it would be fair to their customers as well. Mm-hmm. I mean, their customer really wants the job done. He wants he wants to get the dirt moved out of his backyard and get his new pool in there. Mm-hmm. If it if it becomes about the money, it's because the job's not getting done right. The job is done right. The customer is going to be happy to pay for that price if it's reasonable. Yeah, can't be triple what somebody else is. Probably shouldn't even be double. But if it's thirty or forty percent more and it's flawless, and that customer can trust that contractor and the guy does everything he says that he has control of. Anyway, he can't control the weather, but um, I mean that's pretty much what all business is about. I think it comes down to you have to find people that have a problem. You set an expectation. Yep. And then you have to execute and actually deliver on that expectation at or above that expectation. As long as you do those simple things, it can be as complex or as simple as you want. That's really, I think the fundamental of, and then the more, (laughs) the the bigger the problem is, or if that problem is associated with revenue generation, which is why I prefer B2B businesses, besides the fact that they work during the day instead of nights and weekends. Um, But their problems are bigger, which is why I generally speaking, encourage people to look at B2B businesses. If you're thinking of starting a business, I don't think you should start direct to consumer right now 
because it's a big scaling game. But um, you know, back to this revenue or this value thing. So Ziggler had more value proposition. Now we, we're talking about what's valuable to the customer. We have productivity, we have uptime. We haven't even gotten to the rest of these, but those two things alone, notice that doesn't say anything about it's a little bit about the durability of the product, but in general, both of those things are a full solution. Mm-hmm. It's about the dealership, it's about parts and service, it's about parts being in stock so that you can actually do them quickly. Yeah. You mentioned market share. Um, now, this is something that I think most small businesses, it takes a while to get there, but market share when it came to Ziggler, I mean, that's a big deal that Cat just has massive market share. How did that help you guys at Ziggler to uh, follow through on your promises? Like, what did that look like? Well, I think it's probably the key. Caterpillar was, all, from as a manufacturer, was always on their dealers really hard. Um, they, they The dealer... Not everybody can be a cat dealer, and and uh, they have a very uh, tough filter that you need to be able to pass through to be a cat dealer. Um, and part of it is is you have to have enough, you know, financial capacity to do what they need to have done to protect that market share. And that is, you need to have the shops, uh, the shelf space, and the parts inventory to be able to to support those machines. Anybody, you know, I, I get a kick out of these new manufacturers of cars, and and, and it's in the machine business too. You know, some of these foreign manufacturers will, uh, well, they'll introduce in the in the excavating ma- magazines or newspapers big two full page ads about their new product, best warranty in the industry. You know, four years or ten years or, you know, and I, I always tease people and go, well, I tell you what, I'll sign an affidavit guaranteeing you to live a hun- to be one hundred and ten years old. Well, do I have to back it up? And so that's what I try and ask them is, tell me what actually happens when you have a failure. Mm -hmm. And it's getting back to that dairy farmer. I need a part. You don't have the part. So I need a machine. You don't have a machine. So I got to own another one. So I got to buy two. I got to buy five for the three that I need. That is not very good economics. So what are some ways you can push in knowing? So if, if somebody's hearing that and they're like, aha, now, if this is an accountant or if it's a salesperson doing B2B sales, whatever it is, whether they're a graphic designer, a videographer, or if you're in any sort of B2B sales, you know, how do you push in to draw out a little bit of identifying what are those things? Like I, just understanding what does it look like when it goes poorly? I, like what tips do you have or, or things that you've learned that help a salesperson identify what is it? Look well, like? if you're a landscaper, if you're a roofing contractor and you're, su- you're supplying, you know, do, do you have, you know, good credit at your suppliers? Um, is that a free flow of, of uh, materials? Do you have a good crew that you've, you know, treated well and that they answer your phone call and come when you need them? You know, it's kind of your responsibility as the general contractor to be able to have re- the resources available to go get that job done. And it's not easy to start out that way. You have to build to that, mm-hmm. but that's how you do it: is you, you, you don't screw it up. You know, mm-hmm. don't bite off. Be careful of the risks you take, but when you take a uh, a calculated risk, follow through with it so that you maintain a good credit rating at all all of the places you have to borrow money, and and uh, treat your customers well so that they're willing to give you a down payment ahead of time to go ahead and purchase the the supplies you need, and then treat that help well. I mean, obviously, we know today in 2021, good help is almost impossible to find. Mm-hmm. And uh, when you get them, you you got to treat them well. You have to lead them well. It isn't just paying them. It's being a good leader. Mm-hmm. And all of the pieces of leadership need to go into that as well. Leadership so crucial for smaller organizations. A lot of times it's you, you get away with starting a business. And as long as you can kind of make some sales and execute enough to keep afloat, um, entrepreneurs often, <laughs> small businesses notoriously, will neglect their leadership and they stay stuck. You know, yeah. if you ever see the figures of how many millions of small businesses there are, there, you're like, really? <laughs> and you start realizing, yeah, yeah. there's lots yeah. of micro businesses that often I think are stuck because they don't have a uh, leadership ability and administrative or, or managerial skills. Right. Like, honestly, there's just a, there's a professionalism yeah. that if you don't have that honed um, makes life difficult as you try to scale. Right. But so you just talked about, so if you're a company, make sure that you're leading your staff well, make sure that you are following through on all your promises. Don't bite off more than you can chew. Do Work really hard to execute on any promise that you've ever done. Proactive communication. 
I think proactive communication, just, Hey, I'm about to, I'm about to come out smart. Like the proactive yeah. calls that you're coming out uh, the couple days before the day of the day after, Hey, is how is everything? In fact, that's a good point, Rob, because for every appointment that, that you made that you reserved time in your calendar for that your customer forgot about is your fault. Mm. It's not his fault. And so Anytime one of my salesmen would say the guy didn't show up or worse yet, if I went with them and we got there and they weren't expecting us, I had like zero tolerance for that. That was a salesman's job to, you know, to, to keep in contact and make sure that they're expecting us. In fact, looking forward to our arrival mm-hmm. so that we can get their, their business. Done That's a simple off. thing for small businesses. That's right. Just proactive communicate, yep. double check your appointments execute well, be early to be on time, and then try and delight your customers. I always laugh. People ask me, I have all these videos about how to get more Google reviews, right? And and it's always, there's the simple thing of, well, did you ask, right? But I always start with, in a phone call when I'm talking to a business owner, you need to make sure that your service finished with a bow on it, right? Did you actually finish all the expectations? And you should probably not ask for anything when you call to check on that, right? So I think a phone call that it's like, hey, Debbie, how you doing? It's Rob. I was up on your roof the other day, or we we finalized your roof, or we cleaned your windows. I just wanted to know, does everything look right? Has everything gone well for you? Well, yeah, I, yeah, I think they're all good. Well, cool. I just want you to know we appreciate the business. Yeah. Done. Yep. Now you give it a little bit of time, you can come back to and go to the well. Because every time you're asking for something from anyone, whether it's in a conversation and you're talking versus asking questions and drying out, yep. there's this exchange of equity, I think, that's happening or this exchange of you're, you're taking from them. Um, well, let me give you a little practical example of that. Um, in, in, the, in our world, selling tractors, we were responsible for every lost sale. We, you know, in order to maintain market share, if there was 100 tractors sold wow. and you only got 40 of them, you needed to know where the uh, where the other sixty went. <laughs> we had to we had to turn those in. Uh, we we needed to know it. And so what we learned is that six months after the transaction, when the tension is low, is when you learn. And that's when the customers will tell mm-hmm. you. You know, you, they'll tell you they didn't buy it because you were high priced, or they'll tell you, you didn't buy it because second gear wasn't right. And then you find out six months later, um, maybe they were in a pinch, or maybe you said something that really turned them off, mm-hmm. or maybe you're shop supervisor did Mm -hmm. or the delivery driver. I mean, it could be a bunch of things and they won't tell you that right away, but you'll also learn why they did buy. Yep. And uh, and it's usually not the same thing. You think you went back and told your boss, you got the deal on, you know, it's something totally different. And so keep track of go back to the well when the tension is low and, and ask some good questions about, tell me about the, you know, that's when you want to learn how to, how did I succeed and how did I fail? It'll be totally different than what you think it is when you get the business written. And I think you you need to be in a position to want to hear that too. I think humility and the desire to understand and become aware. You know, my company name is called Feedback Wrench. And it's because in my life, (laughs) during a crucial time of my life, I went through an anonymous survey where we asked like 30 or 40 different people, an anonymous survey. And it was like, what's it like to be around Rob when he's at his best? What's it like to be around Rob when he's at his worst? What do his biggest critics say about him? Even if you don't agree, which is permission to gossip yep. about everything you've ever heard dirty said about Rob. And then how convinced are you that he has the character to change once confronted with this info? So that feedback changed me a lot. And then I'm like, well, wrench, I don't know. We fix things, right? So, but I'm bringing this up because- when you're in a small business, too often they're forgetting that first of all, you can have vision to create a solution for that you can then sell mm-hmm. that would be sweet, right? You may not be there now, but you can get there. But also, don't you want to know how you're perceived? Don't you want to know the wake that you're leaving in right. your life? Yep. Um, whether this is the 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 jobs that you've done for people or if it's the sales interactions you've had, or if it's the relationships you have within your small business, seek the truth. Yeah, that's right. And and it's hard to, if you genuinely want to know what that looks like, That's you have to have rapport with your team so that they understand you're not going to come back at them, that you've kind of fostered an environment where they can actually eventually kind of feed to you. You know, you don't want them complaining yeah. and thinking negatively. Um, yeah, keep those employees in check. 
But uh, if they understand that you're relentlessly for them, right? And this is where my company values come in. But if they know you're for them, this is a long rant. If they know that you're, if your employees know that you're for them, if your customers know that you're relentlessly pursuing their best interests and they sense that, right? Then eventually somewhere down the road, there's this opportunity again, when the tension is lower to find a way to actually double, like, but don't ask for something yet. Figure out yeah. what it is, yeah. right? Yeah. And I, I think that's huge. That That's interesting that you would find out, ah, the shop guy said this, or well, you, you it, were a butthead. Exactly. Wouldn't you want, wouldn't you rather find out why you, your deal is going south beforehand and find out a real reason? You know, you have bad breath or, or <laughs> yeah. you drive a Ford and the guy's a Chevy guy, whatever the reason might be, or that you're too high rather than. He doesn't say anything to you, and then you show up one day, and there's a new competitive machine sitting there. <laughs> but, you know that you feel about that big when you're a salesman, and that there should never be any surprises. Yeah, you know if you're doing a good job. And yet, relationships can be long. You can oh, lose yes. deals. Yeah, yeah. And I've been finding this. You know, I'm getting to the point now. I think I've been in business at Feedback Ranch. I think it was like 13, 14 when I kind of first launched and. Um, you know, I'm getting to the point now where I've had some clients for a long time. I've lost some sales and guess what happens when that stuff doesn't go well, they call you oh, yeah. and you get to fix it. Yep. I mean, do you, do you have some examples? You've told me stories about times where you've lost big deals and all of a sudden it comes full circle. Oh yeah. It, yeah. There was really no customers that were written off. I mean, some of the best relationships I and the whole company had with our customers was because we screwed up and, and, you know, I, the things I'm telling you now were learned over 35 years mm -hmm. and, uh, following up with people and all these things, they do help build relationships. And, and what I, one of the things I, I tried to teach my salesman, a customer calling you and complaining is a gift. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you love to know? I mean, they only call and complain to you because they care. They want to own your product from you. If they didn't care, that machine would be traded off to a competitor, which happened to us. You know, all of a sudden you go, well, where's your, where's your cat? It's sitting over in the John Deere yard. Mm -hmm. and, and it's going to happen and you didn't even know about it i would rather know about it i would rather have that guy so i always thank my customers and said you had you did not need to call me and tell me that thank you for telling me that mm -hmm. now i can do something about it and that's exactly why they called you in the first place that's cool. so thanks for the you know thank you is what every customer who calls in with a complaint deserves and you need to give it some priority to go get it get it fixed and we started this whole thing with, this is about value. So we, we got into those first two points of value and we started everything that we just got to is that these guys have met other businesses, guys and gals, organizations have significant problems that need solved. Right. Yeah. And in the context of, I think, excellent relationships, but as being a guide, there's this thing that happens. You know, if you are a guide to a customer, equipping that customer of, Hey, do you have these problems? I've seen these problems, you know, th yeah. this idea of, hey, yeah. when I'm engaging with an accountant, oftentimes they're, they're struggling with this. Or if I'm engaging with, if it was a, a general contractor, say, when guys are operating a backhoe like this, you serve as a guide to show them, here are the things that you, your counterparts yeah. out yeah. in the industry are struggling with. Yeah. Here's what Kat's trying to do and what we're trying to do to solve that problem. Um, let me walk you through a little bit. Is this something that you've been having? And, and the idea of is instead of you trying to push something on somebody, you're being a guide yeah. to show them, here's what we're seeing as problems. Here's what we're trying to accomplish as solutions so that the outcome of that is that, yeah, oh, that's, those are good points, right? So it's this context of, and inside of that, be, there's a relationship that, that happens because you're not just trying to sell something. That's right. That's the that's thing right. is, yep. <laughs> I always joke. Customers can sniff that out a hundred miles away when they know you're trying to get rid of that specific serial number <laughs> machine on the lot. If, if we're not going in there to be a consultative, um, and I always said, be the, be the cheapest employee that they have. Wow. You actually work for your customer. You're on their payroll. Only you, you don't want to draw a lot out of it. You want to give them more value. And so, uh, yeah. So, so, you know, Caterpillar after being around for a hundred years and Ziegler over it, we're older. We were older than Cat. Think of the database of, of experiences that we can tap into, and that's what we would do. We would develop. Here's the seven. In a, when you buy an asset, here are the seven factors. Yeah. Number one is productivity. Number two is availability. Number three is operating cost. How much fuel does it burn? How fast does it wear the tires out? How are the repair costs? How much grease and oil? 
you know, all, how much cutting edge. So all those pieces. The fourth one is u- utilization. How many different things can I do with it? When the excavator came out, it changed the world because a, a motor scraper could only pick up, you know, six inches of dirt and lay it down. And six, an excavator can do that and dig trenches and, you know, put different tools on it. So that became a very useful tool. So those are the top, you know, the top ones that the four that, you know, how much work do you get done? How how much, how available is it to me to use? And those are, those are really the big wrenches or the big levers, you call them. And then you get into uh, operating costs and utilization. All those things are, are the biggest sensitivity factors. In fact, they're the reason why we always thought we got the major market share mm-hmm. because we built the most productive machine that we had dealerships that provided the most uptime, that we had dealerships and componentry that gave you the lowest operating costs. And then, you know, pretty much everybody makes an excavator. So we're not going to take a lot of credit for that. But cat that innovation comes into that utilization. How many different things can you do with it? Cat has always been uh, very innovative in those. We were the first ones to come out with a lot of different things. Then there's three at the end that are financial and it's really interest rate. Boy, 0% for 48. <laughs> Everybody jumps all over that. 0%, 0%. Well, money's not free. We all know that. Be really careful when you're doing that. There's, you know, make sure you're talking to your accountant and the rest of your partners. And then, uh, you know, um, resale value is another one we talk about. Um, because of all those first four are true, cat, if you go to any auction sale, and look at like machines, the Caterpillar almost always brings mm. a higher resale. It's not a huge, it's not a huge lever in the big thing, but it, but it's, it, it good. summarizes the top four. It's a really good way to measure those top four resale value. And then yeah. the last one, the seventh piece that has the least effect on your bottom line is sell price. Yep. It, so our competitors, you tip that thing upside down, and they tell you sell price is number one, and then you get all this other stuff for that same price as cat, or for mm-hmm. a lot less price than cat. And we were always no, I mean, and spend- what's strange is that it, it's not that you guys have the most propagandists going out there. You sell to an organization that's probably the most focused on price, least amount of value, in my opinion, the federal government, the state oh, government. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so here you are, Caterpillar. Um, and and you're all about value, and yet somehow you guys are the major market holder in all of these government contracts. How does that work? Well, well it's about specifications, and uh, and and really, if, and, I, and I called on lots of cities and counties and and park departments, and they they want their risk to be lowered. You know, they're always those elected officials in the in the you know the. You have, you have heard you call them bureaucracy. But they're really the, the people in those management positions that are hired. Administratives. The administratives. They want to look good to the elected citi- the citizens that elect them. but And at the same time, they don't want to look like they're on the take. Yeah. And so um, we had, to, our job was really to convince them if we made an eight foot paver and nobody else did, why not buy an eight foot paver? You know, nobody else, they made seven and a half foot pavers. So it would be that kind of a thing, or yeah. or we had a 638 cubic inch engine, and everybody else was 466. So our job was to show the value, and then we would put we would put guarantees to all seven of those mm. criteria. We you know we would show the productivity of it through demonstration. We would guarantee the uptime. We would guarantee the operating cost. They obviously knew the interest rate, and then we would guarantee the resale. That's cool. And and we would when you did that math and you draw the bottom line, we always won. So the point is, if you could get one for free and you could choose, I could choose a Komatsu from somewhere, I could choose a John Deere from somewhere, or if I could choose for free, same price, price doesn't matter, a cat from Ziggler. <laughs> you used to say, So you're gonna buy a cat or don't you care? Because <laughs> of all things being equal, generally speaking, people would choose the cat. Yeah, if if uh, somehow we hadn't made him mad, or you know, some salesman didn't burn up a relationship, which which happened, um, yeah, I think most people, if the price was the same, if you ask that question, if the price was the same, what would you buy? Most of them would say a cat. There's some really good products out there that you know really excel in one of those areas. 
You know, there's a manufacturer that talks about their excavators burn less fuel than anybody else's does. Yep. You know, ours doesn't burn any fuel when it's burnt, broke down either. But recap us. So the last thing I just, I, let, let's just recap. So what, what you found was that you were selling heavy machinery from a dealership that had a 20 to 40% margin or premium. Not margin. Not margin, premium. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I don't just, think it was as high as that. I, I would say it was probably, probably fifteen to thirty percent higher. So if, if you know if if everybody else was a hundred thousand, we were one hundred and thirty. I think I think that's probably pretty normal. Mm-hmm. But what you found was that it's less about the front end price, and it's not just about resale value. You're saying that those things are the the least important usually, and I would affirm this. Like yeah, resale value, selling price, and and interest rate are the three bottom of the seven. And yet every accountant thinks that that's the, probably yeah, the most important, yeah. which is okay. But that's also why accountants struggle at selling value, I think, that's because right. they, they yeah. don't understand these other, how are you making more money? So why don't you just recap real quick? What kind so of no, end so on number this. one is pr- productivity. Now, how much work do you get done? And, and that's really where the revenue comes in. So the accountants are concerned about the revenue. So you're getting more work done you're getting more revenue mm-hmm. turned in. The second thing is in order to get that work done, you got to be up and running. So uptime, availability. Um, when I want to run that machine, is it running? And we always thought we gave them as good or better productivity than any other product overall. And, mm-hmm. and that our uptime, we, all, we almost always won that. You know, somebody else could say, I'll give you a free loaner. And if they had one, great. Um, but typically they didn't have one. And then the, the third thing was... Um, was operating cost. You know, it's to, you know, you got to have big enough bearings, you have good enough designs so that things don't break and wear out as fast. You got to have engines that are efficient, hydraulics that are efficient, you know, GPS, all those things make it more, lower your operating costs. And then, and then uh, utilization, the fourth one is utilization. So productivity, um, availability, operating costs, and utilization. How many things can I do with one machine? Those are the four big levers that make you the most money if you can get the best at those. The bottom three of seven is um, interest, rate. interest rates, resale value, and selling price. Yeah. So they all, they all have an effect, but that's the cascading effect of them. And if you might, <laughs> so growing up, we always used to drive by <laughs> construction. I'll be careful sites. what you're saying. <laughs> and, he, and you go, God, you smell that? You're like, what? Smells like Komatsu. Something <laughs> stinks. But also, you eventually got to a point where in your wallet and basically at every everywhere you were, you had little business cards that would teach this. Yeah. Um. And and, and we'll kind of get into how do you sell? How do you how do you help sell this? So these are the principles of what's most important. We'll get into uh, on the next episode here about how, as you're engaging with people, how do you help them? How do you be a guide so that they understand or help percolate those things out? We'll hit on some more of that. Um, but ultimately what's cool about entrepreneurship, you can concoct businesses that are valuable like this, make it not about price. You get to do those things. And, uh, you used to run around with little cards that had yep. these value yep. props and, and, uh, and, and our job wasn't to beat them over the head with these seven no. sensitivity factors. It's to figure out which ones were important to them. You yeah. know, if, if somebody's a, a user of a, a different brand and isn't going to, isn't going to give because he can go out and demonstrate how much more productive he is with his off non-cat brand. I'm not going to sit and argue with that. I, I got to make sure my product produces to its maximum potential, but then I need to, you know, help him out with the other areas because the reason I'm probably talking with him is because he's struggling in one of those other areas, probably more than anything. It would be uptime. Let's do that in the next maybe, episode maybe here. Next episode coming up. Uh, Like and subscribe if you like this. Check out the podcast. Check out the YouTube channel. Go to feedbackranch.com if you need anything. And I love hanging out with my dad. So we'll have more to come. (laughs) Take care.